Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's PMI Friday webinar. It's 3 p.m. in the UK, uh, which can mean only one thing. It's time for the PMI Friday webinar this week with uh, Dennis Clementine Marsh. And uh, the topic is Gemba Walks going to see in a virtual world. Uh, my name is not Susanna Clark, for those of you expecting me, as you may have noticed. Uh, my name is Rich Seddon, and uh, I'm facilitating this, uh, the session today, which includes manning the Q&A desk and the uh, questions and answers and polls and various activities that we'll be doing throughout the session. Um, I'm really pleased to say that this week uh, at PMI, we have hosted our first uh, Lean Six Sigma Black Belt delegates. Uh, back in the classroom after a 14 month gap in our training facilities on our public courses in the West Midlands in the centre of England. Um, and simultaneously, we've been running those programmes uh, in our state of the art virtual classroom as well, with delegates joining in both mediums. Um, a first for us from the public courses, and I can thankfully say at this point on a Friday afternoon, it's been a superb week uh, with some great feedback from the group. And we're really pleased to be able to offer this. So from now on going forward, we have made the decision that our public courses are open, um, both classroom and live virtual. You can choose which way you want to attend. So back to today, um, as I mentioned, I'll be running the Q&A desk. Uh, so please do keep those questions coming and I'll put them to Dennis as we go forward. Uh, as usual, today's webinar is being recorded and we'll send you a link via email early next week to the full recording of both the audio and the presentation. We're also broadcasting live on Facebook and LinkedIn. I can feel my watch pinging to say those streams have gone live. So to those of you joining us on those streams, you are most welcome. Thank you for joining us. To be able to participate in the exercises and the polls, uh, receive the recording via email and make suggestions for future topics, please register at pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars. We'll send all registered participants, participants a short voice of the customer survey at the end of the session. Uh, we'd be really grateful, as always, uh, for you to uh, uh, fill in those uh, feedback forms that take a couple of minutes maximum. And your suggestions for future topics uh, can also be captured there as well. And that is the basis on which we uh, form the schedule and these topics on webinars are put together. So thank you again for your continued support. And now I'd like to hand over to Dennis. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, lovely to see so many on this uh, webinar today. Um, if you see this little th red thing, that is my pen with which I'm going to do some drawings here and there. So uh, don't be scared if you see a red thing buzzing on the screen. It's so, not Dennis's shirt. So on today, <laughs> moving on swiftly. <laughs> um, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Dennis Commentone Marsh. I'm a director consultant and also head of data analytics and insights uh, with PMI. And today we're going to cover the following. What is a Gamba? What are the challenges when you go from the physical Gamba to a virtual Gamba? Then I'm going to show you some cool ways to do a virtual Gamba. I'm also going to give you a universal method for conducting any type of Gamba, both a physical and a virtual one. And I'll finish off with some top tips. So um, clearly the last 14 months have been different. They have been unusual uh, due to the lockdown, but actually Working in virtual environments has, is nothing new. It has been going on for a very long time. Um, so think about your own teams. Are they in a dispersed team? Do you work in multinationally or in multi-site locations? Do you work in different time zones? Or do you work what we refer to as hostile environments, um, which can, can mean a plethora of things, yeah? But in all of these situations, we still need to go to Gamba. We still need to figure out how the real work, ha work happens. And I always use this analogy here of Captain Kirk on the Star Trek Enterprise, who has all these screens around him to understand how the work is working. And that's the analogy that I'm always, um, you know, think through when I think, okay, how do you go about a virtual understanding of what happens around us? Now, like I say, virtual observations have been us for a long time. I mean, I was working on these beasts here on the left-hand side called the GT26 uh, gas turbine back in 1996. And you can see the size compared with the human there. And uh, this was what we referred to as a hostile environment because we had to measure inside this, the pressure, the temperature, the vibration, the flows, etc. And of course you can't go in there in real life. You need to work sensors. So we had a huge test center where we had done digital systems. Back in 2014, um, I did one of the first Power BI graphs, which was where in the world are our PMI consultants 
um, you know, dotted all over the world working away. So again, a virtual way of understanding what's going on in the world around us. Now, part of this today is uh, we're going to not going to have polls, but I'm going to have some exercises. And here we have straight away the first exercise. I'm going to show a photo to you. And on this photo, I want you to describe in the chat window, what would you hear? What would you see? What would you smell? And what would you feel inside this, this donut manufacturing site? So stick some answers in the chat window and tell me, what would you smell? What would you see? What would you hear? <laughs> so yes. we've got sugar coming in, a humming sound. I would feel hungry. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. So think, think this through, therefore. Yeah? We see things. But hang on a minute. Let's just zoom in on this. There's something unusual going on here in this picture. There's somebody, huh? Mark, absolutely. Tommy is rumbling. Huh? In this picture is a gentleman. That gentleman is not wearing the correct equipment uh, in terms of the clothing to be on the floor. We scroll to the right. We see a whole group of operators standing around each other. So now we may have to think, perhaps, Rich, Knight, uh, I'm not hearing a humming sound. Perhaps we have come to a stop. Perhaps there's been a line stop. Perhaps the managers come down to figure out what is going on here. So all of a sudden, in this one picture, we can start to use all our senses if this was a real environment. You know, we were here face to face about using all our senses. Huh? And we may feel the vibrations. And that therefore leads to a small story. It came from Taichi Ono, which you may know is the, the former chief engineer of Toyota. And um, um, the story goes as follows. On day one, a new apprentice comes and the new apprentice is told, Stand in that circle and watch what goes on. And by the end of the day, Taichi Ono goes up to the apprentice and says, what did you see? And the apprentice says, well, I saw stuff, people doing things. I saw things being built. So he said, next day, back in the circle. So the next day he stands there and he thinks, well, why do I have to stand back in the circle? And suddenly he starts to become sensitized to all the, his senses and what the world around him is trying to inform him about. Huh? So that evening, again, there's an interview with HEO. What did you see today? He says, well, actually, I noticed a line stoppage. I noticed there was a shortage of materials coming from logistics. I noticed there was this one guy who pulled the end on court because he needed to get his supervisor there because there was something not quite right. I also noticed that the line was moving at this pace. So basically, what Tijona was trying to teach him <laughs> through the gruff act of just stand in that circle, huh, is to learn to see. And interestingly, I, I recently received one of these updates from, from the, the British Security Services. No idea how it came across. It was one of these things that popped up on Facebook called the four R's. Recognize, realize, record, and react. And I thought, hey, that's quite interesting. Recognize what you observe. So you have to know, of course, what you see, what that means. And that, at the moment, look on your desk, look around you. What do you see on your desk? Is there something on your desk? Actually, that's been there quite a long time. So therefore realize what the impact is. This thing that's on my desk has been there for a very long time. Should that be there? Is it taking up space or should be thrown away or what else? Record what you have observed. And then the last one, react appropriately. So those are the four R's. And I want to keep those in the back of your mind. When you go to do an observation. So part of the, the research I did for this particular webinar is you know, what is a gamba? And actually, I really struggled to find non-English literature using the word gamba. I thought, hmm, let's go back to source. Let's go back to the Japanese. And I realized that the word gamba actually was genba with an N. And I started to figure out what's going on here. And then there were various theories, but one of them was, if you say in English or American English, had the word gamba very fast, 10 times, gamba, 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 it sounds like an M rather than an N. So that's how it became adopted in the Western part of the world. If you research the word gamba with an N, however, it means actually the crime scene. 
which I love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do the crimes get committed at work? Or the actual spot or the shop floor. Then you start reading a book by Jim Womack about Gamba. He says, this is the place where the real work happens and the place where the value is added. And then, of course, the word Gan. It opens up this whole new world called the eight Gs. Ganba, Ganju, Ganji, etc. The actual place, the actual condition, the actual object, etc. And again, I love the fact that here they gave a, a true meaning. We want to see reality when we do a Gamba observation. Now, link to that, and again, I can highly recommend this book by Jim Womack. Uh, it's called Gamba Walks. Uh, go for a second edition. Um, and this word called Genshi Genbutsu, it means go and see for yourself, back to the actual place and the word values being added. And this leads us to a dilemma, of course, because ideally we want to have what, what we call the boots on the ground. Uh, like, remember, I've got this map here of the world behind me, and... Uh, ideally, I want to go back to all these beautiful parts of the world and see with my own eyes, feel, smell, sense what's going on around me. Or now I have to choose a different method, and it may well be I have to use a drone to do some kind of remote observation what's going on. And of course, this leads to a dilemma. When I've got my boots on the ground, I can use not my five senses, but my seven senses. What do we see? What do we smell? What can I taste? And by the way, I'm not going to lick, <laughs> lick the thing of interest. Uh, I'm not a chemist. Um, what do we hear? What do we feel? But then the other two that you may well be familiar with, but I've never may have heard the, the name of. Vestibular is my sense of balance when I walk around, which of course can be quite interesting when we work on uneven ground on a building site or a wet shop floor area or we have to navigate through desks. How do I balance myself through this? And the last one, which is called proprioception. This is this knowledge, this knowledge that the notion that if somebody's staring at me, you can sense that and you say, hey, and you turn around and you look at each other and go, you were looking at me, weren't you? And that's called proprioception. So the awareness of your body position within the environment within which you operate. Now, there are more sensors, but I won't go into much more detail than this. You know, seven is a good start and a good build on five. So now we have this dilemma. How do we make sense of the seven senses in the virtual world? Because we can't smell, we can't taste, we can't feel, oh, hello, puss. We can't detect movement. So how do we make sense of this? Because very often we just reduce to what we see and what we do. So therefore, we need some new means and we need a method. So in the next part of this, word, this webinar, I'm going to share with you the means first and then a method. So question number one, huh? by which means are we going to observe? Uh, Rich, question? Uh, yes, yeah, so two, two, uh, two questions came in. One was, uh, Dennis, where's your cat? And then right on cue, uh, your cat came wandering about. I think that was in reference to the question of what's on your desk that shouldn't be there. <laughs> I, re I rest my case. Cat, your, your uh, bonus is in the post. Um, and then the second is uh, on the subject of observation. Um, Dennis, you mentioned uh, Captain Kirk. Uh, that mm -hmm. is the Enterprise D bridge you have a picture of, uh, on which he never served. Yes, I was very mindful of copyright <laughs> with pictures, but thank you very much. Thank you for Sharp whoever gave that reference. <laughs> Somebody is definitely keeping a good notion and is recognizing the differences. So can I thank that person who came up with that one? <laughs> I will stand corrected. <laughs> so, yeah. So I've come up with a new term, a Japanese term. <laughs> Forgive me for that. And I've created this new term called Bakaru Gensi. Kambutsu, remote observations. And what that therefore means, if you look at the operational definition of this, remote sensing, remote observations, is the acquisition of information about an object, phenomenon, process, without making physical contact with the object or the process of interest, in contrast to what's called in situ or an on-site observation. And we can have a passive one, huh? like this one, where we are recording something this guy says, guys, figure out a way of stealing a, uh, a, a TV without noticing until it's too late. 
or an active one. I'm sending out a signal and I'm looking at the response that comes back from the signal sending out, which is effectively also a bit like a two-way communication, huh? broadcasting and receiving. So there's different ways of talking about sensing and sense source. So I've created an entire new flowchart here, which is around consideration. So the type of observation, the type of environment, recording methods, recording considerations. Is it static? Is it dynamic? Where am I doing? Is it in the office, shop floor? Is it remote, hostile? Is it in a different country? The recording method, is it about synchronous or asynchronous, i.e. online or offline kind of recording? And then considerations. I've just kept it for now simple to bandwidth. Because of course, in the last four or 14 months, I'm sure you've noticed bandwidth is one of the critical enablers to remote working. And then here, I've got a whole bunch of suggestions what you can use for each of these methods. I will pick and choose some of these in the next section of means. So first of all, um, remote login to somebody else's computer, huh? which could be something like Screen Connect. Other software packages are available. Yeah, And the benefit of something like a remote login to somebody else's screen is low barrier to entry, and it's great for static observations if somebody works in a service-based uh, environment, you know, in an office, things are happening on the screens in front of them. There are some downsides as well, and the limitations are often just back to here and see. Or screen share. Just what we're doing now. Um, by the way, by the end of this webinar, we're going to do another exercise where I've done a, a virtual observation with one of my colleagues called Lauren. Um, so uh, we have Teams or Zoom, for example. You can do a screen share. Again, very low barrier to entry. Most people have something like this on their machine. Skype, Skype for Business. Again, other packages are available. And we can use that. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, had to do a remote observation. Uh, what they got to do, uh, because it was in a dynamic environment, the guy just had his smartphone. He did the recording. It was broadcasting through WhatsApp. And he just walked through the shop floor and says, right, now I'm doing this. Now I'm picking up the following, et cetera. Uh, there's also, of course, professional devices, which you can stick, stick on a body harness. And then it can also record, again, sound and audio. And therefore, it can record as you walk along. Some of these can even have a, a, um, a 4G uh, SIM card in it. So you can do, again, live broadcasting to somebody who observes this. Um, and they can interact with you. So again, very low barrier to entry. You can try it almost this afternoon, this evening, or this weekend. Fly on the wall. Fascinating again, we can use CCTV for this. Um, on, uh, at City Airport, um, they now have zero people in the control tower. It's all done remote with different types of sensors. Um, so again, it's great for visual processes where there's not a much, much dynamism. So we can have static stations from which to observe the work that's going on. There are, of course, with all of these, some downsides and risks. So there could be, again, accessibility, privacy, security, etc. Now, the drone. Rich loves me, of course, for droning on about drones. But of course, drones can be fantastic means if it's in a dynamic environment, which is further away from where you are right now, or if it's inaccessible, so I want to do an inspection of the chimney on my house without uh, taking a ladder. I can get the drone up there. We have now lots of this type of uh, visual inspections of uh, our built environment or even of our natural environment. Or again, if we have hostile environments, uh, only this week there was a um, the robot dog that you may have seen uh, a, um, uh, a lot of from Boston Dynamics. They're now using it in the Scottish Highlands to do observations um, of uh, terrains. GPS tracking. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a company and we were tracking the movement of machines on a site. And therefore we could figure out where they were going, where they were stopping, how long they were stopping, et cetera, how many trips they were making. And therefore we can make an assessment about the effectiveness and the efficiency using GPS tracking methods. Rich? Hi, Dennis. Um, I've got a question about trust issues. Um, yep. with the, so in my experience, it's often quite challenging doing Gemba walks in person. Mm -hmm. So doing them remotely with some of the technology, do you mm -hmm. anticipate there would be a different set of trust issues with the people that are working in the Gemba? 
Let me, hold that question, Rich. A fantastic question. I will come back to it in the next bit. I'm going to talk about a method by which to go through the Gamba. So uh, just remind me um, if I haven't covered that sufficiently. You certainly will. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. So uh, lastly, uh, some other means. Oh, the cat is definitely interested in what's going on outside and uses my, my desk as a jumping place to go back into the garden. So um, RFID tags, keystroke logging, digital forensics, remote sensors. So I think interestingly, some of these, so there's something about overt observation and covert observation. And I think the first answer, Rich, I would like to give to people that covert observation is possibly not one to use. Uh, and that does remind me of working with one particular um, organization where a black belt did not get his recommendations um, uh, approved. And the reason why he didn't get his recommendations approved because he had been using CCTV camera to monitor his team without explicit knowledge from his team. And it was all about doing a lean rebalancing relocation of all the environment. And then we asked him the question, why did you use CCTV? And he said, I'm scared of my team. So well, that's interesting because he was the team manager. So we tried to help him with this, uh, unfortunately, because we could not work effectively on that relationship between him and his team. Um, he chose to, 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 to go find a, a different job. Um, in another place, they had CCTV cameras in the, um, in the changing rooms. Uh, another factory, which was not in this country, uh, it was in a different country. And again, when this was highlighted to the, uh, the guy I was with, because we were doing a local Gamba observation, the first thing we said, we have to stop this. We have to build something called trust. And I'll come back to the word trust in a minute again. So, some limitations, therefore, of visual gamba. Huh? If the observation field is highly dynamic, like a large site, where it's not a static, somebody at our desk. If you need sensors for which you haven't got a sense source. So, for example, smell is important. Now, there are all factory sensors available, but it may not be appropriate for the kind of gamba walk that you need to do. So, therefore, lacking the full range of observational inputs ensuring you have the right quality sensor. So again, we all have these cameras, but is that the right resolution or is the right lighting conditions for what you want to observe? Trust and cooperation of the process of observa operators on observation. That is key. Recognizing that the act of observation can impede the observed actions. Yeah, It can actually affect, and especially if you have a bad quality. So Terry, sorry, can we start again? Uh, I didn't I didn't get this. Of course, you're either for impeding what would be a normal working um, execution of that process. And lastly, of course, if we work in an in a observation area where we have challenging situations, environmental factors, are the sensors robust enough? And it could, of course, be bandwidth. Is the bandwidth robust enough? So top tips, keep it simple with in terms of using sensors. Yeah? Start small, you can always make it more complicated. Test different options and test the means in a safe place. And then the correct permissions, part of the trust must be that you meet all the GDPR, safety, legal, regulatory, and company permissions, requirements, and restrictions. For example, a few years ago, when I was keen of, of experimenting with a drone on a building site, we just could not get through all the legal loops and hoops with the organization and get the right insurance in place just in case something would happen to the drone falling or out of the sky on top of the built environment. So all these things are important. However, um, back to the 80-20 rule, yeah? If you think about the 80-20 rule, the majority of us, when we do an observation, very often it's a single individual doing a single activity, often at a single station of work or we follow a single a person doing a movement through a warehouse, through a factory, through a shop floor envi environment. So that's what I'm gonna focus on with giving you this method. And by the way, if you wanna stick in the chat window, if you have different environments and have specific questions around different environments from the 
office-based, service-based environment, do stick them into the chat window or in the questions. So here's the process uh, that I want to talk about. But before that, I'm going to show you five key elements. First of all, the observer, for example, me, who is the observer of, some, of somebody else, who is the proper process operator. We have the process of interest, the environmental factors, and the recording method. And in this, back to that question, uh, Rich, that was given to you, that relationship between the observer and the process operator is absolutely critical. That is key. So a method, just to focus on that, first of all, understand and ensure that the operator understands why you are observing what you are observing. Number two, therefore ensure there's trust and cooperation and agreement prior to the observation, yeah? Nobody likes to go, surprise, I've just been filming you for the last three hours, yeah? Don't do that. Ensure that the observer and the uh, operator understand it's for learning, not for reward and not for punishment. It's for gaining insights. And therefore, what that means is they must follow the normal process of operating, good, bad, and ugly. Yeah? Tell them, don't lay it on, especially for me. Yeah? Just show me how you would normally do this. And then finally, and this, by the way, is my absolute top tip, absolute top tip. Get them to verbalize their thinking and articulate any challenges they are facing whilst trying to operate this process in the normal way, in the normal environment. Yeah, so I cannot stress how important that is. Act normal. Uh, Rich, was that a question or not? Hey, Dennis, uh, it was actually uh, just to let you know that as you were answering this, we just had a question come in about uh, ensuring how to ensure that the behavior either uh, that you're witnessing um, either in a virtual environment or a face to face environment is mm -hmm. real slash normal and therefore representative um, of the uh, of the real process. It comes back. I think it was triggered by your comment about the CCTV um, yeah. Um, monitoring. Yeah. Um Interestingly, um, it may be new sometimes to people if there's a CCTV. First of all, if you were to go to CCTV cameras, make sure the people in the area can see what's being observed. So have a TV screen so they can actually see what is being observed. So they recognize this is what the camera can see. Yeah. Um, what I noticed the first time I've worked in an environment like that, I was, oh, that's a bit unusual. Why is that? But after a while, you do get used to it, especially when you realize what the purpose is. So when the why gets explained. Mm. And I think that's the key. It's not just the what, it's the why, and make it overt, not covert, if and CCTV is the way by which to go. Yeah, but I think um, certainly, I th I'm sure you'd agree with me, Dennis, that uh, the CCTV should be a last resort in most environments. And the, the, the two footprints on the... On the uh... On the on the floor, the is by far and away because you can answer questions live, answer queries yeah. live, ask questions live as well. Yeah, and absolutely, um, and that also is another challenge. Rich is um, when you observe somebody huh, in the old days. Do you remember time and motion? Huh? Well, you have the grumpy person with the stopwatch and the clipboard. <laughs> yeah, going, <sighs> sighing away. Yeah, so make sure it becomes a collaborative approach. But maybe that I say, look, for the first observation, when we're first going to do this, I'm going to be silent. I may do nodding, and I will come back to that in mm. terms of how do, can they see me if I do a virtual observation. Um, so let me just go first. So next bit is there for the methods. First of all, very high level, three points, three steps. Number one, prepare the observation. Number two, execute. And number three, follow up. Now, within that, we have some sub-steps, which I'll go deeper onto onto the next few slides. So first of all, prepare the gamble observation. First of all, define the observation parameters and scope. What are we trying to accomplish? Yeah, part of the three question model. Number two, contract the expectations with the process operator. Ask and offer. What is negotiable? What's non-negotiable? What are they prepared to do? What are they not prepared to do? and then prepare and test the observation method. And again, always in a safe way. 
to minimize risk, minimize harm to yourself, to the other person, or to the organization you're doing it with. So within define observation, back to what's in scope, out of scope, is it static or dynamic, and EHSE risks. Contract the expectations, not as the what, but the why, back to trust cooperation, and back to learning, not for rewards or punishment. And then the last one, in terms of the hardware and software, consider what you're going to use for that and test it out. Huh? Verify that for any environmental factors that may get in the way. For example, if you have something that can't get wet and you're doing the observation outdoors, uh, you may need to have an IP5 or IPX6 uh, waterproofing uh, rating on the equipment. And then the last one, of course, for verify all permissions are obtained. This next step, the next step, execute therefore the gamble observations. Observe the process of interest and gather data, articulate then the process, and this is done by the process operator and identify quality concerns. So within the observation, decide how to record the observation and not only focus on what's called primary data, but also secondary data, just like uh, the lovely person said, that's the deck D which was never the next generation. I, I'm going to hate this now. Uh, you're going to hold this against me for, for forever after. Uh, highlight issues and challenges with the recording methodology. And then also look for the gaps. Don't just look for what you see, but also look for what you don't see, what you don't hear. What are you missing that you would normally expect from your experience when you do that observation? And then, of course, when you articulate the process, this again, um, this came from um, a lovely uh, uh, friend of ours that we used to work with called Tabitha. And um, she used to do all these user studies. And um, the one thing I learned from her is, get them to articulate. So articulate the thinking. So right now I'm grabbing a pen. I'm now going to the screen and on this touch screen, I can draw, draw a circle. Now. Unfortunately, because the position of my screen is not quite a nice circle because it, I'm doing it freehand. So by me talking, the observer therefore goes, ah, right, freehand, the screen is not flat, um, etc. So now I can write down some notes. Also, if you say, right, there's something unusual going on, then articulate if you're something unusual in that transaction. For example, I've just been given a set of data and it's incomplete, I now have to do some rework. And you go, right, okay, that's unusual, that shouldn't have happened, I make a note of this. Within that, make sure they don't skip the details you see them doing and don't articulate. So, hey, hang on a minute, Rich, I just saw you pop up the video. Um, was that on purpose or not? So don't make a judgment, but always what's called a seek to understand. And then the last one, identify the quality concerns before which we can have a number of lenses. And I'll come back to a number of lenses in a minute. So video on or off. Uh, this morning, I did a, uh, a micro Kai, uh, Kaizen, I keep calling Kaizen Gemba experiment with my colleague Lauren. And my, I always say, keep the video on because for two reasons. One, I can never read non-visual, uh, non-verbal clues, but also, they can see me in this virtual environment and they can see me going nodding. They can be seeing go continue. You're doing a fantastic job. Yeah. So you want to build confidence that what they're doing is helpful. Not necessarily right, by the way, but it's helpful. It helps to understand what's truly going on. So that's why I always advocate to have video on. Now, which lenses should we use? Of course, the system of profound knowledge but also use the lens of waste and value. Use the lenses of 5S. How organized is what is it what they're doing? Use the lenses of eight wastes. Use the lens of the outcome model. What are the assumptions and the attitudes? Think about the task, think about the method and think about how they feel about what they're doing. So the social, emotional, political environment. And lastly, like I say, the non-verbal communication, which is, of course, is the majority of the communication if you're dealing with uh, a, a human being, uh, as in a human operator. So which data should we collect? Uh, classic ones, uh, cycle times, delay times, data quality, 
the adherence to the standard operating procedure or the deviation from that for general reasons or for unconscious reasons. Huh? I always know this shortcut here and you go, right, ah, shortcut. Is this a good shortcut? Should we make it standard? And of course, if articulating this always goes wrong. Now, part of that, of course, is what's called the hidden factory. By them articulating what they're doing, and of course, you being the observer, you go, ah, actually, I think what you're just doing is not quite right. So we can go through some of the sentences, some of the wording, the language. Huh? I think it's the wrong data I've just sent to you. I'd better modify it. Or they've been told, actually, I need to drop what I'm doing with you now. I have to switch priorities. Or I've now been waiting for two days for a response. No, that's not what I meant. Can you just email me, me again? Or I don't know if you suffer sometimes this. Hiya, I've sent you voicemail, text message, WhatsApp, uh, also meeting requests. I just need to make sure we talk about this. All hidden factory, none of it's value add. Or this isn't perfect, no work, run, et cetera. Now, if you want to see a webinar on this, by the way, go and watch uh, Warren, who had a whole webinar around rework the hidden factory. So, how do we record observations? Now, of course, let's go old school. Yeah, number one, just pen and paper, have a pen and paper and make it up. Or have a stopwatch, have a, a physical stopwatch or have a stopwatch on your phone if you want to do time recordings. But there's something else I would love to draw your attention to. If you have Office 365, you can use recording within Teams. The nice thing in recording in Teams is it then uses a, is something called Stream. And in Stream, then it does an auto captioning and the auto captioning does a transcript and this transcript has timestamps on it. And I was reading through transcript from this morning and I realized that on this time here, about three minutes into doing the process, it says, actually, I have here an issue. I couldn't search for half of my name. Right, quality concern, bang. I've got it written down. I do not need to double entry it. And I've got the timestamp as well. Fantastic. The other thing you could do, if you have an SOP, export it into OneNote as a PDF, as images, and then you can mark it up around it. You can draw around it if you have a touch screen method. So uh, we've come nearly to the end of this actually, uh, Rich. So uh, what I would like to do here is do a, um, a little exercise where we're going to show a short video. And in the short video, I just want to share with you, um, again, very short. And what I would like to ask the audience is to stick in the chat window any observations they're making whilst Lauren is explaining the process of interest. So can Wake up audience, get ready, chat at the ready. Yeah. So feel free to enter what do you observe when she is going through this. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Dennis. So thank you for being part of my micro uh, gamble observation. Um, so articulate loud what, you, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And if you encounter any problem, tell me if there's anything that you see and notice that is not part of the normal standard operation of this process. Okay. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, Over to you. Thank you. Um, so the process we're doing um, today is adding a delegate to a group where they might not have got the content automatically. Um, so normally flow picks up if it's like a standard course, it would pick that up. But sometimes our customers have customized programs. So we need to add those to the groups manually. Um, so first step is to log in to the LMS. Um, we've all got our own username and password for this. Which I'm not um, going to tell you, by the way. So first things first, actually, I did notice this yesterday. There's been an mm -hmm. update to the LMS overnight. It's it's not major. It happened yesterday. But this they've changed the icons from circles to like these rounded squares. And although not major, it is distracting when you're looking for a specific shape. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go into um, administration down here, um, we can navigate to the groups and find the group that we are looking for to add um, me to. We'll see. I'm very reliant on my own broadband here to load the mm -hmm. number. So yes, I'm noticing broadband subtle delay here indeed. I'll make a note of that. 
And thank you, Kate. Absolutely, yes. Um, there was a big loading lag on this, and yes, so, the change rollout. Um, so thank the other you, thing Kate. about this, actually, that I could do put in a note on is that it only searches uh, full words. Um, so mm -hmm. if I just put half of the word of lean in, it doesn't um, return that result. Um, which can be quite frustrating when you're as click happy as I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so if we pop in here. It's quite weird listening to your own voice, giving little signs of, of encouragement there. So again, quite a delay, isn't it? Yeah, and this is because we're trying to record this and I'm pushing my broadband to the limits. Um, <laughs> Just hope that someone isn't trying to watch Netflix somewhere in the house as well, and then we'll really be in trouble. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you can uh, just navigate um, to the members tab, um, click add, um, and if I just search myself here, um, same issues apply. So I couldn't search for for half of my name there. Um, mm -hmm. You have to have to put the full full whack in. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's added that content directly to my profile, um, so that's um, all done. Lovely. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. No problem. Bye for now. Bye. So, um, hopefully, you, what you've noticed is a few issues here uh, that, that that were in this LMS um, uh, in terms of doing this process. She found some quality concerns. She was articulate, articulating it. Uh, I was giving some some words of encouragement here and there. Uh, and now, of course, say, hey, I noticed some other things. I can go back. Um, so back to the high level process. Therefore, by the end of this, the third step, therefore, is now the follow up. Huh? Say, hey, Laura, I now noticed something else. Was that right? Um, and by the way, um, in terms of what you saw on this, uh, I did check it out that there was all PACA uh, to, to share uh, here. Um, so interview the process, uh, operate to see clarification, redo the observation, talk to SMEs, um, to somebody perhaps who, who owns this system. Uh, report the findings. So therefore, this is the best form of reporting, which may therefore be the flowchart that you saw Lauren having on the screen share on the right-hand side, which we can now start to mark up. Uh, all the uh, uh, the transcripts that I've got now in stream and verify with the process operator. Was that what you meant when you said this? And then agree the next step. So if there was no standard, of course, standardize the process. If there was a deviation, return to the standard. And if it was the standard, the current standard is insufficient, then improve that standard. And that may then be, for example, through a quick fix or an HD project or a green belt or black belt project. So some of the ways, therefore, we can do the follow-up. So those are the three steps, have prepare, execute, and follow-up. Uh, and that which leads me then to my summary with the key points. Uh, first of all, the four R's, recognize, realize, record, and react what goes on within the virtual world. Number two, huh? the Genshi Genbutsu, go to the real world. Uh, place where the real work happens, IRL, huh? in real life or virtually. Prepare, execute, and follow up with the Gamba observations and trust each other and ensure it's for learning and improvement or reprimand. And then finally, a small variation on the last time I ran a webinar, you can improve what you can measure, you can measure, you can define, and you can define what you can observe. So, Rich, that is the end of this webinar around virtual uh, Kaizen, um, <laughs> Kaizen events, virtual Gemba observations. So you're um, not getting away that easily, Dennis. So we've ah. got so we've got some questions on the on the desk that uh, mm -hmm. just want to run by you. So I can't even believe I'm saying this, given all the aggro you, uh, you give me uh, on, on this topic. But Dennis, any recommendations on drones? Uh, again, back to purpose. Um, and back to uh, what you want to use it for. Um, it, I can only talk about the, the British licensing uh, process, uh, which any drone over um, 250 grams in weight requires a license for the drone and a license for the operator, um, which I both have um, in terms of the drone that I've got. 
anything below 250 grams therefore has different regulations. If you go to the CAA website, it will tell you what you can and cannot do with different types of groans, uh, groans, drones. There's uh, five classifications, C1 to C5, uh, all the way up to you know 20 kilo plus drones. And of course, the heavier they get, the more the restrictions will be when you want to observe something where there is an interaction with humans. Mm. And typically, therefore, you need to have a cylinder around the environment, which is like a 50 meter cylinder and also um, a height of 50 meters. But again, there's also legal limits how high you can go, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, I have done experiments with the drone using uh, a virtual mask in my house where we just fly through the house to do some tracking and tracing. So the smaller the drones, of course, you can make some of these uh, more uh, enclosed environments or restricted environments come to life uh, with a drone. But I very happily, if that person has got a question around it, I have to take the question offline and reach out to me. Okay. I can give you some more uh, pointers around it. But go to the CAA website and make sure it's legal and compliant and safe to do so. And there's also commercial implications um, where you then need insurance, uh, personal liability insurance, etc. Mm -hmm. I hope that's answering the question. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Um, so, and uh, next one is around mining of data. So, mm -hmm. in the in the past twelve months, we've had to rely on remotely accessing uh, service system data mm -hmm. to understand uh, service ticket turnaround times um, and uh, operator behaviour. Yeah. What would be your advice about letting the operators know that you're doing this? Would it damage? Uh, sorry, we came to the conclusion that it would damage the accuracy of the data if they were aware that we were going to mine it the following week. Fascinating. Uh, I think you, per, again, very personal personal um, um, view on this. My mantra is no surprises. That has to be, that's my number one mantra. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that means that I will tell the operators that part of the learning for improvement is what's going on. Because the last thing you want to happen, in my view, is to go, hey, Rich, I noticed that in this thing last week, you, and again, the pointing finger, you did this. Mm. The chances are that then they're going to hide it. So if I know that you're recording this, I'm not going to write it down. Mm. So, and that's what the last thing you want. But if you tell them, I'm actually going to learn from this and I will share with you the outcomes of what I'm observing, they will probably say, well, actually, I know more things. Um, and back to what's called the Hawthorne uh, effect uh, or the Hawthorne experiment, we know that the act of observation can impact behavior, mm. but rarely in a negative way if there is a trust environment. Um, so my number one is always back to the GIP model, build trust, build cooperation, and tell them why you're doing it. Um, mm. So. Yeah, and that, this is a personal view, of course. It's a very fine line to balance that, isn't it? Because thinking about the uh, the three question model, how do you know a change is an improvement to get a sensible baseline? Mm -hmm. I think the answer, you know, you're absolutely right, Dennis. The answer from my point of view, again, personal opinion, would be it depends. It depends on what you're using it for. It depends on what the purpose is, mm. um, and uh, and uh, and therefore address. I, I wouldn't say there's a there's a right or wrong way, uh, particularly mm. about doing that. But as you say, trust is trust is relevant. And a point, a point in the chat here just come in from Mark. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's actually a question. Um, do, do you would you actually show the video directly to the operators, uh, not just follow up with uh, questions um, with with details or questions? Why not? Mm. Yeah. What What's the worst that can happen? They're going to say, "Oh, I hate my own voice." <laughs> 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 which, which you know, I, I don't like the sound of my voice uh, when I listen to it. Um, so again, in reality, whenever I've done a remote observation of somebody, typically everybody's busy. Uh, I tell them where the video is. I tell them this is where it is. You can view it if you want, but often there's just not time to go for them to watch it mm. uh, in reality. However, what, what often they have got time for, hey, have you got 10 minutes now? Just some clarifying question. Can we just go well, through this yeah, element here yeah. again? Yeah, and there, yeah. there's the strength, isn't it? And I think that coming back to that data question, the same applies there. Um, when reviewing that data, 
Um, it's absolutely one of the key points you've made here throughout the uh, throughout the webinar, Dennis, is uh, involving the people involved in the process who work in the process yeah. in the improvement activities and therefore the interpretation of it and the understanding of it um, is critical. That They will be able to explain why they were doing whatever they were doing, either in the data set or in, in, in the remote video in a way that a, a, a passive observer uh, simply cannot grasp. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just this week, I was doing some coaching with some lovely people. And I said, shall we go through the documents? I said, no, first use your own words. And interestingly, when they were using their own words, I was picking up details <laughs> and nuances that were not in the document they had written. And therefore, that actually helped me to therefore dive deeper and gain insight. Because, And this is a fascinating one. And I don't know if you've developed a skill yet, but I cannot read minds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you know, I can, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so part of that, of course, is when I use words, they may mean something to me because I, in my head, I've got a whole model behind that one word. And of course, then it's the challenge is for the observer, what did you mean when you used that one word? Yeah. And that's always there for, and then how do you articulate that? And that then becomes that deeper insight. And very often, the person who then used that one word says, oh, I made an assumption that actually I knew what that meant. But by mm. you asking the question, I'm questioning myself if yeah. I actually truly understand it. So it becomes a two-way um, two process. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Thank you very much for everyone for your questions. That's fantastic. So if you could jump onto the next slide for me, Dennis, please. That's fantastic. So um, the, recently you'll have noticed we've been uh, heavily promoting our uh, Lean Practitioner Yellow Belt course. Uh, it has been rewritten. It is fully virtualized, but because of the, uh, the comments I made at the beginning of the session and now open to classroom places as well, you can choose how you attend uh, our public course programs. Next one's coming up at the end of the month, 29th and 30th, a couple of places left on that. Do take a look at pmi.co.uk forward slash training to understand more. And finally, Dennis, um, the schedule uh, for the rest of the month is uh, for the webinars is also uh, up and available. So do take a look. Next week uh, is myself, uh, make a difference now. Um, five things to uh, make a difference in the next 30 days. Uh, big ask, I'll be building on some of Dennis's comments today. And then that builds, uh, feeds into the one the following week, which is prioritization. What of those things, how do you choose to work on the vital few? So. Um, without further ado, please do look out for the Voice of the Customer Survey. Really grateful for you filling that in. And on behalf of Dennis, myself and PMI, we wish you a safe, relaxing and happy weekend. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.